At the end of 2013, the EDSAC Reconstruction Group met once again in the National Museum of Computing, which occupies part of the site at Bletchley Park. The reconstruction is well on track, with yet more working hardware on display today. This room is in one of the listed buildings used by the wartime code breakers. In these utilitarian huts, their pioneering work led to Colossus, the first digital electronic programmable computer. It broke high-level German codes in 1944. Colossus was rebuilt here by enthusiasts in the 1990s and runs regularly in one of these buildings. The museum's policy is to have working machines wherever possible. The latest working exhibit is which? The so-called Decatron computer built for Harwell in the early 1950s and it's the world's oldest original working programmable machine. EDSAC, built a few years earlier, will be assembled alongside which? This is the uh, room where the EDSAC replica is going to be. They just started to refurbish it from its previous use. They're getting on with it very quickly. We have a, a very tight schedule. There's a viewing gallery. People will come up the corridor behind there, come in this door over here, and the EDSAC will be in rows in, in this place. This is going to be really a very important part of the museum because we have the witch and we have the EDSAC of the same vintage and they will tell the whole story of the uh, development of very early computers uh, at the end of the war. Meanwhile, Andrew Herbert explains the search for the actual programs run on EDSAC by the pioneers who were laying the ground rules for this new technology. The first program that Wilkes wrote a paper about is something called the Airy integral, which he wanted to tabulate. And it was writing that program that caused him, um, as he says in memoirs, to discover debugging and realise that most of his life from there on out was going to be spent debugging. Pioneers are given no fault, they just kind of assume you write a program it would run. <laughs> the idea that it wouldn't, it might take a while to fix, um, I think came as a rather unpleasant surprise. And the final one, um, some of you may have seen the um, report written by Don Glenny for the, what these days is, is Harvard's like Weapons Research Establishment under its old name, and they have a batch of worked examples at the back, um, which are quite nice demonstrations. They're interesting if you think, what is this physics of then? Um, one of them, which is solving a batch of simultaneous differential equations, is clearly a diffusion problem. And one imagines it's a diffusion of radioactivity after a blast. Um, and they do a work solution of that, and they publish... Nigel Benny has been working on the arithmetic unit. This is a test rig for the, the core system of the EDSAC. And the core comprises of the accumulator, which is 72 bits long, wide, a shifting unit, and an adder. This area is, it looks a mess. It is just a testbed facility for generating signals to drive this. The oscilloscope is so that you can see what's going on. But the EDSAC part is just the grey shelves. So what's happening at the moment is the number zero is being circulated forever and ever in this system constantly. And you can see that, that on the scope there's, there's no, no pulses. What I'm going to do now is inject a, a number in there, just a simple number like three for example. We're going to add another three to it, which gives us six. And we have another three to it and we're up to nine, so it's eight plus one's nine. Now I can shift that unit, which multiplies it by two each time, so I've got nine. If I multiply it by two, by doing that, you see it moves up to, to 16 and two, is 18, which is two times nine. And if I shift it one more time, two 18s are 36. Uh, and there we are, 32 and four is 36. So it's been multiplying by two each time I shift it Moved it up another time, 72, 64 plus 8. Arithmetically, that operation is very cheap. It doesn't, it doesn't take very long to do that. Whereas if I did a full multiplication using the multiply unit, that would take many, many um, small machine cycles to get to that answer. But simple numbers like dividing by a power of 2 or multiplying by a power of 2 use the shift unit, very much more efficient. But this will add together, the adder will add two numbers up to uh, 36 bits wide, that's about 10 decimal digits, um, and 
store them forever and ever. This is the reference design, or the, the, the Mark I, if you like, for the initial orders generating circuit for the EDSAC system. Now, in no way, shape or form does this resemble what's going to go in the final system. This is the system which generates the, the bit sequence of the initial orders which goes into the memory tanks and starts the whole story running. This is the clicking noise that you used to get when you dialed the old rotary telephones. And so on and so forth. Okay? So these things would have been very common in the late 40s uh, because it was, it was mature technology, it had been around for ages, everybody had them, they're all lying around in all the labs. It's the natural thing to use for a sequence generator, which is effectively what this is. What you've just seen there is going to set up the initial instructions for the entire EDSAC machine. This will put the machine in the state where it's ready to start receiving higher order instructions from the tape reader, from the operator, from whatever. What we can see is the chassis type one, a replica of the only prototype from the original machine which exists in our little display museum. Data which is put into this is turned into radio frequency pulses which then go through the mercury tanks where this very small radio frequency pulses come out, amplified in this and turned back into EDSAC pulses. And the whole point is that going through this system, through the mercury tank and back into this system makes a closed loop which is the memory of the EDSAC. That's why it's called a delay storage automatic calculator because the signals are delayed in the mercury tank and we can hold up to 576 digits in that mercury tank and then they're rapidly regenerated in the chassis and that makes the uh, storage element. 32 of those all together in the computer together with another nine with short mercury tanks. This represents a, a tank, a mercury tank. And in fact I've got written on the front here dummy tank. It's a dummy short tank. What we've got here then is a setup, a test setup, where I'm sending in data into the chassis. That's turned into radio frequency pulses which come out and through this coaxial cable through the 38 microsecond delay. Note that that's equivalent to 19 pulses, 19 exact pulses. And those go back into here. The little signals are amplified. They turn back into exact pulses. And there's one more delay in here. And then they're recirculated. So one delay in there, 19 pulse delay in here. So we've got essentially here a 20 pulse delay line, a, a, a memory for 20 digit pulses. The waveforms coming in from our test equipment are on here and we can see on this top line of the oscilloscope we can see a word 100111 and that's being injected into the chassis and it's then turned into radio frequency pulses. Now then we can see that signal here. Can you see that here we see our 100111 and these are not beautiful pulses but bursts of radio frequency at 13.5 megahertz. Quite fast oscillations in a burst. That's, that's what is, was originally sent into the mercury tanks and the little signal came out of the mercury tank, similar to that. We want to replicate that in our silicon logic. So back to looking at the oscilloscope, there are the signals going in, those are the ones that are turned into those 13.5 megahertz bursts, those go into the dummy tank, the silicon, and after 38 microseconds they emerge and are amplified and are clocked. So here is the delayed signal having gone through the first few stages of this chassis. So there the signal goes in and there it comes out 38 microseconds later. And that signal itself is recirculated and comes out a second time and a third time and a fourth time etc. And indeed it comes out 20 times or more. So what this represents is a signal going into the memory and that signal being regenerated and stored in the memory and available at the output. Each of these represents the data that we put in being available at the output if we want it at a later time. 
And that's the progress so far. We can make it memorize that exact signal for a millisecond. That's the way it's set up to memorize it for a millisecond. What we now need to do is extend that so that instead of a millisecond, it stores for a second or an hour or a day or several days or whatever. So as of this moment, it's easily storing uh, a millisecond and can probably store for an hour without us um, uh, losing data, but that's got to be tested from now on. I am looking at um, commercial wiring up of chassis 01. There's a, a couple of leads for getting that done at a reasonable rate. That's, that's the um, storage generation circuit and we need about 40, 42 of those. It's very popular. So just getting those made, and we have the design established now, would actually be about a third of the machine filled up. Um, Down the road a few miles away from Bletchley Park is Marshall's Amplification. They manufacture valve amplifiers for rock concerts and have the perfect skills for bulk wiring up of some of the EDSAC chassis. So maybe almost a third of the computer could be being assembled here, ready for the beginnings of the installation in the museum. The team are about to put some of the completed racks of hardware in the new exhibition area, the start of the commissioning of EDSAC.